we're going to commemorate the epiphany today and uh, we hear this uh, gospel of the coming of the wise men and the shining of the light let's stand together please for the hearing of the gospel the holy gospel according to saint matthew the second chapter glory to you O lord in the time of king herod after jesus was born in bethlehem of judea wise men came from the east to jerusalem asking where is the child who has been born king of the jews for we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. When Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared, then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, friends. Good morning, grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God who is our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. I, I told the story downstairs at Sunday school, but if you weren't there, I'll, I'll tell it again. It comes from the Islamic tradition. Uh, one night there was a king who was roused from a sleep by the fearful stomping and stamping of something on the roof above his bedroom. And alarmed, he shouted out, Who's there? A friend, came the reply from the roof. He said, I've lost my camel. Well, the, the king was perturbed at such stupidity. And so he screamed, You fool! Why are you looking for a camel on the roof? And the voice responded, You fool, why are you looking for God in silk clothing and lying on a golden bed? Where do we look for God? Epiphany means the manifestation or the enlightenment that God has revealed himself in this child. And epiphany, in the biblical sense, shows us where to look for God and where God has looked for us. Matthew is the only gospel writer who tells the story of the three wise men. We tend to conflate the Christmas story by telling Luke and Matthew, kind of jumbling them together, but they both have their own perspective. They both have something that they want to communicate, and so Matthew um, ends chapter 1 by quoting the prophet Isaiah, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will give, call him, you will give him the name, what, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Think about that. God with us. What is Matthew trying to tell us? Then Matthew introduces the story of the wise men who come from the land of the rising sun from the east. That's not Japan, by the way. It's uh, Iraq or um, Iran or perhaps Afghanistan. And they come to worship Christ. And the, the story ends um, in, in Matthew's gospel, interestingly enough, he, he begins with this idea of the nations coming to the Christ child. He ends in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission in which he sends his church to all the nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And when we look at the story of the Epiphany and we get this cast of characters, 
uh, uh, we'll see, I think, what Matthew is up to in a, in a very interesting way. I think he's setting the stage for the rest of the gospel. Of course, uh, in this story, there are four main characters. There's the Messiah, who's the theme of the story. He's, you know, the, the Christ child the, is the Messiah. There's also the wise men, and they're called in the Magoi, uh, uh, and means um, um, the, the ruling class of intellectuals, okay? The, the Magoi, or the, the Magi. And then there is what we're going to introduce as a monster. And finally, there is a mother. So let's take a look first at the wise men, or the Magi. Uh, we don't know much about them. There, we don't know if there were three of them, because that's later tradition. Uh, in the uh, Middle Ages, Bede gave them names. He called them Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. And they really weren't kings. Again, they were intellectuals. They were scholars. And um, uh, they studied the stars. And in the ancient world, there was no difference between an astronomer and an astrologer. If you take those words apart, you'll get the, what it means. An astronomer, an astro means star, and nomos means law. They study the laws of the stars, just like astronomers do today. And they study the physics of motion. An astrologer looks for a, a logos, a message from the stars. And so when people turn to get their horoscopes read and nonsense and things like that, in the ancient world, that was taken with some seriousness. Now, in the story... These magi, these wise men, they represent, and I, I'm borrowing here from one of my favorite preachers, Fleming Rutledge, who she says in, in one of her sermons, she says they represent the best of the pagan world. Um, you know, we're talking about people who did not have the Old Testament. They did not know the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They didn't even know the name of God. They did not have the covenant of Israel. They did not have the circumcision of Israel. They did not know the God of Israel. And yet they represent somehow the, the light that is in the world that isn't really connected It's uh, uh, to Israel. It's what um, some of the reformers called a common grace, that there is light in the world that, uh, that is apart from the covenant, that li God's light is there in some mysterious way. These magi follow the light where it leads them, and it leads them to Christ Jesus. And I think Matthew's point and one I think we need to kind of recognize, because when we look at the world, it's a big world. There are many different religions, and there are many people of good, good people who are adherents to those religions, some of whom are possessed with a certain goodness and grace and wonder that we all recognize. What Matthew is saying is that all the light of the world, if they follow it, it ultimately leads to this particular person. It ultimately leads to Christ Jesus. Um, and, 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 you know, we, I, I've talked to a lot of people who want to tell me, like, all religions are basically the same. You ever heard that? That shows me that those people have never really studied religion because it's simply not true. There are many religions and philosophies that have um, some common themes, uh, compassion, kindness, worship, uh, all of those kinds of things are certainly common in many of the world's religions, but per the Christian faith makes this particular claim, it's what's called the, the scandal of particularity, that all the light, all the true light of God is found in this child. In this child, we have the fullness, the manifestation of the fullness of the light of God himself. It's everywhere in the New Testament. St. Paul will say in Philippians chapter 2, and he's already quoting an ancient hymn of the church. Think about that. He's writing in the early 60s, and he's quoting a hymn. And it goes like this, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And taking the form of a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of, get this, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That the lordship of Christ is universal. You don't get Jesus among equal with other religious leaders. What Matthew is saying 
that this particular child is the Messiah, is the light, the manifestation of God, not just for the Jewish people, but for all all people in all the world of all religious faiths or none now you got to remember how important that is because it's going to come up again in just a little bit now the magi if they represent the best of those who are drawn to the light of christ there's also a character in here who is a monster and it's herod herod who is known as herod the great and what we know of him from the scripture, we know even more from extra biblical sources. Herod was a ruthless tyrant. Uh, Caesar Augustus said of Herod, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Because Herod had three of his sons murdered because he feared they were conspiring against him. And so later on in Matthew, this is very, um, um, uh, what we would read in Matthew is very consistent with what we know from these other sources because what follows is the slaughter of the innocents when Herod will send his troops to Bethlehem to kill all the children two years old and younger. Do you remember that story? This is true to what we know of Herod, nicknamed the Great. Now get this, both Herod and the Magi heard the same gospel promise the king the messiah has come and he's living in bethlehem the monster couldn't stand it because it threatened his sovereignty and it does the same to the monster in each of us that's what original sin is remember adam in the garden adam and eve what was the what was the sin you will be like God, grasping to be like God. We're going to set our own rules. We're going to set our own agenda. We're going to be our own kings down here. That is the besetting sin of humanity, not wanting to live under the true king, the true light of God, but to make our own rules, have our own way. Now get this, that's why the world crucified Christ, because the world said, I don't want a king. I want to be a king. And we all do it in our own ways. It's not just someone else. It's all of us. It is the original besetting sin of humanity. And it can only be healed when we kneel before the true king and confess, take our crown off, take our gold out of the box and give it to him because I'm not a king, you're not a king, he's the king. And when it says they paid him homage, I'm not a big fan of that translation because the word there is, um, in other places, uh, translated as worship. When they brought out their treasures, they worshiped this king. They themselves, again, were not the king. They were not the sovereigns, but they worshiped Christ Jesus. Uh, Martin Luther, in um, a famous passage from something called the Heidelberg Disputation, said it like this, man wants himself to be God, and he does not want God to be God. We need to ask ourselves where that's true for us, not for somebody else. Where do I want to say, I'm not going to kneel and take my crown off. I want to have my own way. You know, God's nice to have if I need a helping hand, if I need to be successful and get a promotion or have my kids stay healthy. I need God. But when I take that crown off and God doesn't become a means to an end, he becomes the end, the telos of my life. That's what the three wise men or how many wise men there were recognized. And that's what we must recognize when we fall down and worship this king. There is the magi, there is a monster, and the other person in this story, again, the Messiah is the theme, there is the mother, there is Mary. Now, Mary is such, I, I love Mary. I, I, I do, I, I love the Blessed uh, Mother because she represents not only this openness to God, be it done to me according to your will, but if you read, for example, Revelation chapter 12, go home and read Revelation chapter 12, you'll see that Mary symbolizes the church. The church is like a mother who bears children who are brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus. That's everywhere in the fathers of the church. It's everywhere even Luther would say that. That Mary is a mother. And what does this mother do? Listen to this. 
they saw the child with his mother. You know, I've been here, I, I'm, I'm in my you know, uh, third partial year as the senior pastor here. You know, I came in 16, we made it through 17 together by the grace of God. Now we're into 18, all right? It's pretty cool. And, and I've been thinking and praying, what? How do I best serve this congregation? The time that God gives me, where do I best help shepherd this congregation? What is the image I would hold up? What is the vision I would share with you? And here it is. This is what the church needs to be doing. You people say, bring in the smoke machines. I don't want to do anything like that. That's not me. Let's show the world Jesus. Let's show the world like a mother holding a child. You know, my kids were little. I remember my daughter, the firstborn, and I would show her to everybody. I was, I was you know, it was awful. You want to say, Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she the most beautiful baby you've ever seen? You know? And they were like, well, you know, it's a beautiful baby, but there's a lot of babies. No, no, this is special. This one's special, I'm telling you. And, you know, say, with Mary's like, she, and when, when we understand the, the, the Blessed Mother, it, she doesn't point to herself. She's always just, look at my son. Do whatever he tells you to do. John chapter 2, that's what she says. Let's just show the world the reality of Jesus Christ. And to do that, you've got to take your crown off. And you've got to throw it down because you're not a king, you're not a queen. We together are servants of a king. And a... That's what we need to do. Show the world oh, the truth of this person, the manifestation of this light. Now, some of you may still be wondering about that star. I find that intriguing myself. I think it's obvious that the star was not a natural star because stars don't shine over one spot. I mean, I know how to find the North Star. Look at the Big Dipper. Those uh, two stars point right north. And if you follow the North Star, they, they lead you north. It leads you north. But if you get north, it's always further. It doesn't stop over the North Pole. So I think this was a, a supernatural light, a supernatural star, and the ancients understood it that way as well. I love the way St. Benedict the Sixteenth, now emeritus, says it in that little book that I shared with downstairs on the infancy narratives. Listen to this. It's not the star that determines the child's destiny. It is the child that directs the star. The light of God, the light of any truth in this world that the Messiah is like a magnet that draws all light to himself. Whatever light there is, whatever stars we follow, if it's truly light, they lead us to this particular child and we take our crowns off and our treasure, we cast it down and we worship this king. Why would we follow another star? I, I, I love to go to Walmart and you're in the line and you see those tabloids and they tell you, know, what is the stars thinking? I don't care what those people think. I mean, you know, it's interesting, but they have no more authority or wisdom than anybody else. But there is one. And he's the gift of God. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and carefully found out from them the time when the star began to shine. Jesus is the star who was born. And that brings me back to the beginning, the most important point of this story. Whatever stars we follow, and each of us will follow what light we have, we need to be certain that the lights, the stars we follow lead us to Jesus. We live in a dark world, and I won't be Pollyanna about it, I, I ask uh, Kathy, you can't see it very well, but this uh, is uh, the Adoration of the Magi uh, by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And if you look at the painting very closely, you've got them uh, um, worshiping the child, but in the background, the world is filled with warfare and mayhem and all kinds of bad things. We live in a dark world. And sometimes, friends, I know, I understand if you're here today and you have struggles with faith, I know that sometimes the world can seem so dark that it might even seem that God doesn't exist. You know what I mean. Sometimes the world can be that dark. But we've got this light. 
And that light makes faith possible. So, why would we look for a camel on the roof? <laughs> Silly. Why would we look for God except in this child? And then take our crowns off our own heads, fall down in exceedingly great joy because this child has found us. This child has made everything worth living for real. May it be true for us. Follow the light of Jesus Christ. Follow the light of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe we're going to confess our faith now. And the creed will...